people. We are very excited for this talk tonight. So I'm sure most of you are still uh, responding and reacting to uh, the COVID statistics that came out today. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, you will have a chance to kind of change your thinking uh, for, for our talk tonight. Um, we're also uh, very fortunate uh, to have the, our guest here with us tonight. And we'd like to both thank and acknowledge the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Management for their support of this lecture. And just before I begin and make the introductions, I also just wanted to talk for a minute about uh, the, the tool that we're using tonight, uh, Microsoft Teams Live. Uh, so I want to remind everyone that the, the way we can make this as interactive as possible is through asking questions. Uh, so after the talk, we will uh, respond to the questions, uh, but I encourage you while the, the talk is going on to add your questions. Uh, you can read other people's questions and vote on them. Uh, so this will help us uh, moderate and triage and, and make sure the most important questions get answered. Uh, so just wanted to, to give you that sense of uh, that's how this evening will go. The mission of the School of Information Management is to lead in advancing information management knowledge, research and expertise. And we see information management as contributing to the economic and societal success of organizations and that it plays a vital role in creating and translating knowledge and in making evidence-based decisions. So tonight's lecture fits perfectly with this mandate as we examine how data can help us understand crime, solve cases and disrupt the industry, so to speak. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Uh, Michael Arnfield joining us tonight with a career that spans his work as a police officer and a detective to his academic career as a PhD. And of course, uh, very much as an author and a, a frequent speaker. Uh, we're very excited to hear what he has uh, to say. So I wanted to uh, make sure we had plenty of time for the talk and not as much time uh, for me. Uh, so I will now turn things over to our guest and thank you very much. Thanks, I'm gonna start talking. I don't see myself on screen yet, but uh, thanks Sandra and, and, and thanks uh, to Kim Hume as well and uh, to everybody at uh, Dalhousie, the, the appropriate faculties and departments that um, spearheaded this and invited me. I'm quite excited to be here uh, virtually. This is my first uh, conference talk or uh, seminar using Teams, so uh, we'll see how this goes. But um, what I wanted to do here tonight is, um, I mean, whether as faculty or, or, or student or, or staff, I mean, if you're involved uh, with any of these schools, particularly um, information management, I really want to showcase some exciting disruptive things that are being done with data in the context of crime and specifically uh, homicide. So you're going to learn tonight um, sort of how we're using records with two initiatives that I've uh, spearheaded. Uh, one is the Gold Case Society here at Western um, in my office now, uh, where students and faculty uh, combine to, um, uh, through an interdisciplinary lens, uh, look at cold cases. And I'm gonna be talking about a specific case that uh, we actioned a few years ago and the very exciting recent results that we've gotten. And the second group is the Murder Accountability Project which is a not-for-profit based in Washington, D.C. Uh, and where I'm a co-director and we have fast become the definitive accountants of, of homicide, um, homicide analytics and just uh, general trends uh, in the U.S. We've got a database of about a million murders now that is publicly searchable and interactive. And again, some exciting things uh, are going on there as well that you will learn about. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So I often uh, like to begin um, 
my talks and my books with an epigraph or a, a quote that sort of encapsulates and, and captures the flavor of, of what's to come. So uh, a lot of homicide scholars like to, uh, or homicide detectives uh, like to quote Sherlock, or from Sherlock Holmes and, and Doyle's novels. I actually think there's more compelling literary detectives out there, but in this case, um, the quote from The Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, the world is full of obvious things that nobody by any chance ever observes. And this is so true, uh, especially when it comes to trends in crime and uh, murder in particular, as um, the legally and morally the biggest crime, so to speak. But there's also a great deal in the world in the context of, of homicide that eludes us. Uh, and in, of, with respect to crime generally, in terms of uh, there is a great deal of crime that remains invisible and always will. Crime is not meteorological phenomena. It is not something that you can objectively and passively just gather data on because it's immediately available. All we know about crime data and the statistics that we rely on for everything from insurance rates to um, how police are deployed and how budgets operate uh, reflects only what is known. And again, it's not weather that can be observable by everybody. In fact, most crime will never be known and we're only capturing a small uh, fraction of the available data. If I could have the next slide, please to demonstrate. So this is known in uh, police studies and criminology, and I suppose by extension, uh, analytics generally as the dark figure of crime. And iceberg analogies, like Swiss cheese analogies in terms of data are a bit trite and time-worn, but it's appropriate in this case uh, as a visual representative of the fact that um, most crime is actually below the surface and not seen. So like an iceberg, uh, the various statistics we rely on only capture what is reported or otherwise becomes known to law enforcement. And the conventional wisdom is that uh, up to two thirds of all crime goes undetected and unreported. So you can imagine a scenario and everyone, some people may have found themselves in this situation. You come out in the morning, if your car is parked outside, and maybe you left it unlocked and sure enough, someone's gone into your car and rummaged through your car uh, and maybe taken your, your coffee money or your sunglasses. And uh, so technically uh, someone has been trespassing at night. That's one crime. Uh, they have committed theft and mischief, a couple more crimes. Um, and you may or may not report that. You may just remember to lock your car next time and realize the inconvenience of reporting this uh, and or your cynicism about reporting it that nothing's going to be done um, may lead you to never make that a crime that is, that is known. That is now one incident that forms part of the larger dark figure of crime. And one incident isn't necessarily compelling or, or fatal or, or incidental to the breakdown of the system, but that's one person. Maybe seven other people in that neighborhood experienced the same crimes overnight. And what if they all just avoid reporting it. That will actually, uh, that is a representative, a corresponding uh, sort of leakage in terms of that municipality's ability to capture and track crime by zone, by neighborhood. And you can imagine on a national pattern or on a national level, how this pattern might emerge and the deleterious effect that that would have on accurately capturing uh, crime data. Now, I know what you're thinking is that's a break into a car. It's a nuisance crime. What about more serious crimes? Uh, assaults, sexual assaults, frauds, uh, more elaborate thefts. Again, for various reasons, personal reasons, whether it be mistrust of the system or of the police or uh, embarrassment uh, or uh, just, again, convenience, uh, cynicism. Uh, there could be any number of reasons that people don't report these crimes. And until recently, people thought, and I say people, the general consensus was uh, that the dark figure of crime represented mostly property crimes, some personal crimes, but certainly not murder. The thought was, how possibly could you have a murder go undetected, have someone disappear, 
um, and the police never know about it or wind up dead and the, and the police never know about it. It's never captured by these various statistical mechanisms. And we now know there's one way that could happen, what we call the missing missing, which is unfortunately a, a major problem in this country uh, with respect to marginalized persons, people who um, fall through the cracks, uh, fall through straight through the bottom of the safety net and have no um, sort of guardians or, or people that, um, that sort of are in their orbit to the fact that when they go missing, no one takes notice. And we'll never know how many of these people are actually out there, and that's why they're the missing, missing, the missing, uh, and the victims of foul play, in most cases, and uh, their disappearance and subsequent murder, if that's the case, have never been tabulated because no one's gone looking for them, and in many cases, uh, don't know that they exist. So again, law enforcement can only track and then report in this country to the Canadian Center for Justice Statistics, which is a division of StatsCan, uh, crimes, including murders, that they are aware of. So that's one scenario where uh, a homicide could become, uh, remain in the shadows and part of a dark figure of crime. Next slide, please. So that's why you'll see, uh, so here we have um, some recent statistics, the most recently available statistics covering two years of uh, overall homicides in both Canada and the US, obtained from uh, the US uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics and from StatsCan. So you can see um, there is a slight uptick in both countries between 2018 and 2019. And these are the numbers for whatever reason that uh, politicians, the press, uh, advocates, some researchers fixate on. Uh, is it up or down? Is it up by how much? Uh, in what cities? There's a whole host of other questions that are not being asked here, uh, and it's not the number itself that is significant. So one of the things that, for instance, uh, we focus on here and at the Murder Accountability Project is the fine print that has increasingly been appearing whenever these statistics are published. And you'll note I have it sort of bolded out here where these are, again, murders known to law enforcement, known to law enforcement. Law enforcement is increasingly understanding that uh, murders go missing, that they get misclassified. They become what are known as uh, invisible murders. Again, part of that iceberg that's, that's underneath uh, the surface. If I could have the next slide, please. Case in point, here's a chilling story um, to put the context of invisible uh, murders before you or to put that phenomenon in improved context. The Robinson family in Mississauga, Ontario, uh, and this is something, uh, I mean, the, the most creative of crime writers could not come up with this scenario and it unfolded between 2009 and 2013 where three members of the same family in the same house were systematically executed by a serial killer who entered, murdered one of them, left, waited for the tide to wash over, came back again, murdered again. And it wasn't until the third victim, the adult son of this couple, that police finally clued in that maybe these were murders. The first one, the murder of the father, was deemed to be natural. Um, the murder of the mother was deemed to be an accident after she was beaten and thrown down the stairs. And it wasn't until the killer returned the third time and bludgeoned the son who is now living alone in the home where both of his parents were murdered uh, that the police realized based on the violence at the scene that maybe they should go back and, and look at the first two. So had this third victim not been claimed, you have a serial killer by definition, two or more victims in two separate occurrences, uh, which is what the offender in this case is, who not only got away with it, he didn't sort of elude detection and outsmart investigators. No one was even looking for him because his crimes were invisible to the police. They'd been misclassified and mothballed and um, essentially caught because he got sloppy. Uh, it's a terrifying prospect. And um, the thought was, well, this this has to be um, you know, a, an outlier. This, this is just bad detective work. Um, 
you know, he he didn't even really make efforts to cut to stage the scene or cover his tracks. Just conclusions were jumped to scattershot theories were adhered to very quickly uh, because they did not seem like quote unquote conventional murder victims. And in fact, the, the motive here was uh, there was a bitter custody battle going on and the, the partner of the adult son's ex-wife uh, was essentially picking off this family to eliminate their rivals in court. And then people like myself started looking at overall patterns of this. So uh, around a couple of years after this was revealed, uh, again in Ontario and in my neck of the woods, a nurse named Elizabeth Wetlofer confessed uh, to um, her counselor that uh, she had been systematically executing patients for several years. And again, all these deaths, so a, a healthcare serial killer in this case, all of these deaths had been misclassified because of the age of the victims. She worked in long-term care because of the age of the victims, they had been summarily classified as natural. And in fact, she was in some cases euthanizing them either out of mercy or in some cases just because they annoyed her. And we'll never know how many victims she claimed. They exhumed a number of them and we know of between eight and 12, it's likely much, much higher. So that's two separate serial killers in one province in the span of about five years. And this begged the question, how widespread is this? Has the murder data we've been relying on for years uh, been fallacious and only again scratching the surface? Uh, how many other serial killers are out there, uh, again, not on the lam, but hiding in plain sight and no one's even looking for them? Next slide, please. So Ontario's chief coroner, Dr. Dirk Hyens, realized that this was probably a bigger problem than was thought. And he decided, hey, uh, this is getting embarrassing. Let's go back and look at all deaths ruled undetermined. So in terms of uniform crime reporting, which is a large scale system I'm gonna talk about later and uh, probably one of the last large scale systems to not be technologically disrupted. Uh, one of the classifications for a death used by police is undetermined, basically saying uh, we don't know. Maybe it was homicide too, too difficult to tell, uh, but more likely not. So we're just going to sort of park this, keep it in abeyance. And for now, it's just undetermined. So he said we need to look at all of these and look at what was missed, probably something to tip, tip the scales from undetermined to homicide, the other classifications being accidental or suicide. And he said, let's do this going all the way back to the 80s to arguably another, uh, again, very famous uh, victim of someone who later became a serial killer because their first murder was misclassified as undetermined, uh, Tammy Homolka, again, the sister of Carla Homolka, who was the partner in crime with Paul Bernardo, arguably Canada's most notorious serial killer. So thousands of cases were looked at as, as part of this inquiry. And what's remarkable is only one was reopened as a homicide. Next slide, please. So Joe Grizel, again, this is an Ontario case, was a cadet at the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario and in 2003 vanished from his room and was found in a river near the university. Uh, it is a university uh, but by definition, um, about two weeks later. And there's a host of unexplained injuries, including uh, the fact that he had had some chipped teeth. His clothes appeared to have been put back on in a way that suggests he did not dress himself. Uh, and he had recently eaten despite having been missing for two weeks. So um, the military police criminal investigations branch initially looked into this and they said, oh, this is this is a suicide. He jumped into the river, uh, I guess in theory, uh, two weeks after just sort of uh, wandering aimlessly and as a fugue state or something, they had no real evidence to back up this theory, but they they quickly jumped to it. The family protested. There was some other evidence that uh, something nefarious may have been going on and um, the Ontario Provincial Police was called in now. So now you have a relief squad coming in and they said, no, we don't think suicide, maybe accident, but undetermined. 
and there it languished for 15 to 17 years uh, until here at Western, our cold case society at the request of the family, re-examined this case with fresh eyes using our interdisciplinary um, array of expertise, both existing uh, experts here, subject matter experts on faculty, uh, including myself, as well as emerging experts, graduate and undergraduate students who have a passion for this and knew nothing about the case and could look at it with no presumptions, no bias whatsoever, and inferring no conclusions based again on uh, previous experience or some other agenda. We tabled the report, we provided it to the family. The family met with the chief coroner, presented him with our report, and he was so moved by the report and by the family uh, that this case uh, 17 years after the fact is now actively being reinvestigated as a homicide. The only known one that is part of this inquiry uh, has been reopened, uh, which suggests number one, the work being done here uh, is compelling and important. Uh, and our role as um, sort of uh, outreach for families and, and matchmaking families with appropriate government officials to get action is, is very important. The other one, the other side of that coin suggests that uh, a lot more were missed. Had it not been for our intervention and the family getting a hold of uh, Dr. Heyer, would this also have been screened out? How many others were screened out? There's still a problem. So my thought was, we'll take this to the Murder Accountability Project next. Again, the, the accountants and statisticians of murder in America, where we've got a larger pool to draw from and where we can more expeditiously get access to the records we need. If I can have the next slide, please, Kim. And we looked at, again at what's wrong with the Uniform Crime Reporting or UCR system as a large scale system. So if you think about other large scale systems, whether it be databases to track uh, bags at airports, hence this representative image or, or uh, smart grid traffic light systems, uh, I mean, there have been improvements made uh, that are geometric in recent years based on the uh, the way that we can program algorithms now um, <clears throat> and just improvements in, in big data generally. But UCR, contrary to what I think people would like to think and, and hope, um, something that tracks all crime, a system that tracks all crime uh, is consistent in both Canada and the US and uh, when it comes to murder, you would think operates efficiently is actually a very loose patchwork of um, sort of server and mainframe and paper based uh, record keeping, particularly in the US. And if you followed the US election uh, where it was just an unmitigated disaster in terms of what states could count efficiently and just continuity and provenance of records, um, this shouldn't necessarily surprise you. The, the US election debacle, I think, showcases uh, deeper problems in terms of the, these large scale systems that we take for granted work and they don't. And uh, the first experiment we conducted proved that. If I can have the next slide, please. OK, so this I'll have to come back to that. This is an older version of, of the slideshow. Uh, I reorganized the slides. That's fine. Um, another system that uh, I'm going to come back to UCR and um, missing murders in a second, but uh, on the top, still on the topic of the murder accountability project, I'm going to pivot now to another system uh, in terms of uh, again using data to track offenders, which is known as uh, in Canada the Violent Crime and Linkage Analysis System, and the United States as the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. And again, the thought is that this system uh, will work properly and uh, that it's compulsory, so, so it, it must. Well, um, first of all, let me explain how this system works. The idea is that every violent crime, including murder, has a number of uh, boxes that need to be ticked, uh, almost 300 of them in a standardized form that uh, where the questions and boxes reflect offender decision making at the scene with a relationship if known between the offender and the victim, uh, the location where the body was found or the crime occurred. And the thought is that you build a sort of data composite of who this unidentified killer is in many cases. In some cases, there'll be a name to go with it. 
but its true value or theorized true value comes with respect to unsolved cases, whereby if the questionnaire is properly completed by reflecting an offender's uh, actions in Saskatoon, and that killer, in many cases, it moves to Halifax and offends again using the same modus operandi or method of operating, MO, that the system will recognize these uh, two different crimes as having common characteristics unique to that offender and the two and the system will make that match. Say this crime is A is connected to crime B. This is a serial offender and this is how we know he or she operates. So again, a loose patchwork of compliance with this. In Canada, the system VI class is compulsory, but we know there's huge problems with it. Number one, the people filling out the questionnaires suffer from decision fatigue. So in the middle of an investigation, you now have this paperwork. You've got to fill out this 300 question uh, question form. And uh, in many cases, they're not properly trained on what they're being asked. Uh, I've provided this same talk for um, senior criminal investigators who, for instance, didn't know the difference between an MO method of operating and a signature, something that is unique and expressive and, and typically fantasy related or ritual related and has no bearing on the effectiveness of the crime uh, versus the purely instrumental nature of the of the modus operandi or, or the who, what, where, when and why are required to successfully carry out the crime. So one is instrumental, one is emotion. Well, you can't make informed decisions when completing this form and, and, and the data inputs uh, that are asking about uh, signatures if you don't know what, what they are. In the US, it's even worse because um, the system is voluntary. So you want to, you know, you, you're working in Detroit and, or Chicago, there's 15 shootings a weekend. And on top of that, uh, you want to fill out this 300 question form. Uh, compliance is naturally very low. And what happens is you have bl data blind spots all over the country where there's undetected or, or missing murders and where serial killers operating, geographically transient serial killers operating in different locations aren't being tracked from, their crimes are not being tracked from location to location. If I can have the next slide, please. So a great example of this is uh, Samuel Little. Sam Little, who's, who's currently incarcerated in California uh, and a Texas Ranger on a hunch about a year and a half ago, uh, when it flew out to visit him because he thought that uh, he had made a connection, not using VICAP, but using his own sort of rolling up his sleeves and sort of um, hunting and pecking through old news stories, thought that he open source data, thought that he had found a potential link to uh, one of Little's known victims in California to a victim in Texas in a, in a, in a cold case. And he built a rapport with him. And uh, before long, Little was confessing to over 100 murders. And he has a eidetic memory and was able, I mean, going back to the 80s, remember exactly what his victims looked like. And he created the, these chilling sketches of the women as he last saw them before he murdered them. And he turned them all over to this Texas Ranger who's sort of become now the point man in doing the job that Vicap should have done. Uh, all of these cases bearing the same MO and signature uh, were never linked because, I mean, in some cities, he was, he was very trained. He's a coast to coast killer for the most part. And um, police in one city would dutifully fill out the VICAP, VICAP uh, questionnaire and input the data, uh, but it had nothing to, to bounce off because in the other cities, there, there, was no, there was no sort of receiving match. So he exploited unintentionally, unwittingly, again, the, the blind spots all over the country and the lack of compliance with this, this data system and was able to offend with apparent impunity until as he got older, he started making mistakes and eventually got caught. But how do you not confess to this ranger all these murders, in some cases, again, uh, undetermined murders, not even flagged as murders, um, and even the ones that were confirmed as homicides, uh, would have gone, um, would have been considered standalone discrete events, never linked and never solved. 
And at present, uh, most or all of his confessions have been uh, corroborated and he is uh, confirmed now as the most prolific serial killer uh, in American history uh, and one of the most prolific globally. And no one knew he existed. No one knew that these crimes uh, were linked uh, because there was no um, representative data for them. And this takes us to sort of the, the, the next chapter in this, in this saga. Uh, that same Texas Ranger then uh, reached out to us at the Murder Accountability Project. So out here at Western, I have victims, families, and some retired law enforcement reaching out. Um, this Ranger reached out to us knowing that our database, our algorithm, which I'll explain in a minute, is far more reliable than that of the federal government. If I can have the next slide, please. So at the Murder Accountability Project, uh, our work became known to him as it has to a number of, of law enforcement officials, data scientists, homicide scholars, uh, and um, who have been sort of scouring the database. They have a hunch that maybe a ca a ca their case is connected to one in another state, and it's all interactive. Uh, we have diligently gone um, to, the to the federal government and then department by department across the US uh, and obtained all of their uh, UCR data. They cannot provide us with the, the basic uh, data and it's not by cap because um, again, most departments don't don't comply with it. So there's no data to, to give us through open records. So basically we get every year massive data packets containing uh, basic case level information on every homicide known to law enforcement. So we decided since we're now holding all the cards, uh, we could probably build our own simplified VICAP. So while it may be voluntary uh, and discretionary at the police department level, we have the police department's data now. So we can build our own and run every murder through it. And we realize you don't need 300 separate inputs. You only need about seven uh, to at the very least narrow down probable matches. Are we going to have uh, some false positives? Yes, and then we'll do further research. But we are capturing a much larger picture and uh, making connections that would ever, never otherwise be made because number one, the the, the VICAP uh, questionnaires are in many cases improperly filled out, uh, so matches won't be made. And um, there's no standardized training on how to complete them. And they're also voluntary, so um, we can build our own. And what you're looking at here on the right is by simply using uh, strangulation of female victims as a uh, discriminator or as a search parameter, you, that everywhere you see a dot is where there is an active serial killer in America right now. This is a 25,000 foot view of the continental United States and you've got about uh, 3,000 active serial killers right now. The conventional wisdom that the FBI always used was that only 1% of homicides are likely the work of serial killers. Well, I've just explained to you the problem with that hypothesis. Number one, we know that a great number of homicides never even come to the attention of law enforcement to draw out or to build out that, that number. Uh, and number two, um, they're only relying on serial killers uh, on that data in terms of serial killers that they know about. Killers like Little, uh, he's one. How many others are there? Well, you're looking at that. So um, we found some especially notable links in a few cities. Gary, Indiana, uh, notified authorities there uh, who initially rebuffed us uh, until this killer uh, made the mistake of killing, uh, murdering a woman in a neighboring county and had a different and more effective police department conduct that investigation. He was arrested and then later uh, confessed to the murders back in Gary that we had identified uh, and we believe many more uh, that again our software was able to to make the links and these are again um, much like DNA matches that are, are done or fingerprint matches that are done again through databases uh, we review them in an analog fashion and, and vet them uh, in order to corroborate that yes this is a compelling match so that was one that was the first main one uh, and then we have other ones in Cleveland um, where we alert authorities there. They promptly investigated, formed a task force and made an arrest within a matter of weeks. Again, 
not knowing that these murders were linked in their own city until we fed them through our system. And the other one, the big one, uh, well, there's two big ones in Atlanta and in Chicago, where we've got, we estimate 40 cases that are connected and have a very specific modus, modus operandi that again, because of how they're spaced um, and just in a city overrun with, with crime have, have um, our needles in haystacks, unfortunately, and, and no one has made the connections until we did. They are listening uh, and taking this very seriously. Uh, and the chief of detectives there is, is in dialogue with us. So data-driven uh, disruption to conventional detective work, and certainly in terms of matching crime scenes and offender behaviors, uh, specifically across uh, not only specific uh, cities, but, but ent entire jurisdictions. So you can use this uh, it's not, we are working and I would be, I would like some feedback actually from, from people on, um, on attendees or, or people they may know on, on improvements that we can make. Um, I mean, this is run uh, out of a very basic server in a closet in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Like this is, um, this is not the war room. This is a kitchen table. There's 10 of us and we, we meet via Zoom before Zoom was a, a thing. And, um, I'm the only Canadian and the rest are, are sort of across the US. So uh, you can search as as you're able. And again, I apologize if you sort of need a tutorial in it. Uh, maybe that's a whole other talk, but um, and this is why it's becoming a useful resource for law enforcement and for researchers, because if you have a very peculiar crime, say someone is defenestrated or thrown out a window uh, over an apparent lover's triangle, or that, that's your theory and the, the offender was never caught. Um, you could search for that. You could search for victims of defenestration coast to coast uh, of a certain age or a certain gender or all ages and all genders. Uh, and um, you could even specify that that was the motive. You could also say just any motive and get more matches. But uh, this is really real time uh, hunch verification using uh, big data acquired through open source. If I could have the next slide, please. So then it was time for, and this is where I was going earlier, this, then it was time for our next experiment. This, now we're back to uh, not only missing connections or serial killers whose crimes aren't being connected because of um, holes in the system, uh, blind spots as I call them, but murders that are unknown to law enforcement that are still relegated to the shadows, the dark figure of crime that are uh, deleted uh, or invisible murders as the two recurring terms uh, in Ontario. And we realized there was a way that we could do this quickly and efficiently. So the Center for, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, the CDC, um, everyone, this is a household term now, if you didn't know, based after the pandemic. I mean, you had Robert Redfield, the director on the news every night, um, the, they're sort of uh, curating and, and publishing all, all the COVID numbers. But for years, one of their duties was to catalog and uh, warehouse and make available if need be every death in America. And they get their data reported to them from other medical professionals. So hospital officials, coroners, medical examiners who submit standardized forms that indicate the cause of death. And there's a, a wider range of potential causes than the UCR system, Uniform Crime Reporting System, uh, uses, but homicide is one of them. So we, again, open records, FOIA said, uh, we need over the last you know, 10 years, every death reported, not names or, or, or dates of death, just numbers. Just what are the raw figures for the number of Americans uh, whose deaths were reported by medical professionals as being the result of criminal homicide? And while we were doing that, we went to uh, the US Justice Department, which gets its information from police departments, reporting again, murders known to them and that are investigated in theory. And so we have one batch of numbers from medical professionals, that the CBC holds, uh, we have one batch of uh, what should be murders, uh, the same number of murders reported or known to the federal government through its police sources. And then we looked at year by year, how do the numbers stack up? And it may surprise you. Next slide, please. So 
So from 2014 to 2018, so you can see here, Centers for Disease Control total number of deaths from criminal homicide to uniform crime reporting system. Uh, so again, that's just the standardized um, reporting mechanism and, and standardized boxes used by law enforcement to, to report murders to themselves and to the government. And you can see that there are around 2,000 and in some years as many as 3,000 deaths from murder or deaths as a result of criminal homicide that police departments are missing. So let me explain to you how this scenario works. Um, someone is found deceased, police attend the scene, deem it either accidental, uh, suicide or undetermined, take no further action, the body is then sent for autopsy or is sent for some kind of medical examination. The medical professional makes a different finding, saying, no, this is clearly a homicide. So for instance, um, a fall down the stairs, summarily ruled an accident at the scene under the circumstances. And this isn't all just, this isn't all, I'm not trying to indicate misfeasance or malfeasance. Um, errors are made. Um, well, a few days later, uh, again, sometimes wounds uh, and toxicology take their time to, to materialize. Uh, someone with a better set of training and a new set of eyes uh, ruling and reports that to the CBC. So one goes off to, uh, the, to justice as accidental or it doesn't go off at all because it's not a criminal homicide. And one goes off to the CDC as a death from homicide. The net records never get reconciled because go back to the US election scenario, um, it's broken telephone all, all over the, I mean, you may have someone who, who dies in um, uh, Atlanta right by the C CDC uh, and it's ruled an accident by Atlanta PD. It's then sent to the DeKalb County coroner outside the city uh, who takes a different position and reported back to the CDC. Uh, as a homicide, there is no way to sort of triangulate all those records and no one actually even tries and, or has tried until we identified um, this issue. Uh, but beyond that, that's probably not the full story. We then looked, we asked for a little bit more clarification, again, while respecting privacy, uh, and we asked for um, breakdown by gender and ethnicity of these missing murders, if I could have the next slide. So you can see, uh, the, so the term Indian is still used uh, in, in the United States to describe um, First, Na First Nation settlements or uh, um, native territory. Uh, and you can see that, uh, and so that this is also the, an ethnographic distinction in the UCR system. So when we delineate or demarcate those, those larger missing ones by year and by ethnicity, uh, and did a sort of an expanded search. I mean, uh, if you if you look at um, the, the the far right margin, uh, in some cases half, and in some states uh, almost 100% of murders involving native victims are never reported as murders, and uh, this pattern is consistent, uh, fluctuates slightly, but is consistent. I mean over a, a nearly 20 year period. So you want to talk about systemic problems. Uh, this, I mean, this of, of the missing annually, this uh, the missing records, missing murder records annually, this is the most flagrant pattern that stands out for reasons that uh, we're still investigating, um, but that should be very concerning naturally. Um, for any number of reasons that are beyond the scope of, of, of this talk. So uh, that's food for thought. If I can have the next slide, please. And of course, then um, this is the other um, real takeaway. So we know that um, the way things exist in the UCR system as um, really an industry, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a service sector industry that um, tertiary part of the economy, you could say, where uh, multiple people are employed providing services in relation to criminal homicides. But uh, 
it is a broken system and the service performed is um, is far from consistent and uh, in many cases counterproductive. So we know that uh, serial killers are being are invisible, many of them, that there's probably 10 times more than was previously hypothesized because um, the the database that ostensibly tracks their crimes uh, is um, is really only running at a 10% capacity, um, maybe a little higher. But until uh, Murder Accountability Project, um, there was holes all over the country. We're trying to now mitigate that. Uh, we also know that uh, thousands of homicides a year get missed. They get misclassified and never reinvestigated, never revisited until maybe uh, that killer who walks free keeps killing, becomes one of those 3,000 serial killers and eventually gets caught. Maybe the earlier crimes, like in the case of Bernardo, will be re revisited, but probably not. And then, then this final figure should come as little surprise. What you're looking at is the declining, uh, plummeting consistently. Uh, so well, everyone's probably been looking at, at, uh, at COVID graphs uh, that are going the other way. Uh, this one has been on a continual descent since about the 1940s, and that's the, um, the solved rate for homicide in the United States. Um, and again, we use the US as sort of representative model here because this information is, is more readily available through murder accountability. I tried, for instance, to build uh, an algorithm with the assistance of our tech people at murder accountability um, using that same seven point uh, VICAP um, facsimile that will map where the matches are. If you go back, uh, if you remember back a few slides, all the dots all over the US, I tried to build that just for Ontario. I thought it would be interesting. So I filed a number of, of uh, FOI, Freedom of Information applications uh, with a grant, uh, had uh, our research assistance, and one department of about 50 would complied and provided us the basic data, seven data points. We didn't said we didn't want names. We didn't want any identifying information. One complied. So uh, obviously that's not enough to build out the system. Uh, other departments tried to either price us out with just astronomical figures, didn't respond, claimed that, uh, you know, if we made this publicly interactive, that people could figure out who the victims were uh, that are represented in the matches and that that viol posthumously violated their privacy. Um, so that's my sort of quick aside on why a lot of this is US centric. But what you're looking at here is the the compelling decline in the number of murders that are known to law enforcement. So this doesn't include the ones that we still know about. This doesn't include the thousands every year that get misclassified. Of the ones actually being investigated, this represents the, the success of bringing those investigations to a conclusion with a charge or what we call a clearance. So there were more murders solved in the, in the 40s than there were uh, last year. Um, so before DNA, before big data, all these databases that are supposed to be a panacea for this issue uh, and which really um, are just spinning, spinning their wheels. 2016, if you look at the graph, actually marked the nadir. Uh, the low, there were fewer murders solved, uh, fewer killers caught, again, known to law enforcement in 2016 than there were 50 years prior. And uh, no one knows why. There's a few theories. Um, so I mean, we don't need to get involved, but one is that killers are getting more sophisticated, maybe using forensic countermeasures, uh, not leaving as much evidence uh, to, for police to work with. Another is um, just uh, budget slashing with police and that there is a sort of fatigue and uh, a lot of these investigators are phoning it in. I, I hope that's not the case. I hope the, the first scenario is not the case, um, but there is a problem here. Uh, and it is reflected in um, is reflected ultimately at the brass tax is that uh, killers aren't getting caught and are out there walking around. And I've spent this lecture trying to underscore uh, the um, the problems with data collection and curation and accuracy that explain that, that make it such that this figure should not be as necessarily shocking to you as it may have been yesterday or a few hours ago before I explained to you um, 
you know, how many broken spokes there are in this in this wheel that is that does not spin efficiently. So um, with that, if I can have the final slide, I'm sort of winding down here. Maybe I've got some contact information here um, and just general information on my forthcoming uh, book that will describe all this and, and why this is a major problem and what regular people can do to actually uh, help out. And uh, a lot of it boils down to um, to getting records uh, and and being creative, disrupting. Like uniform crime reporting uh, is, like I said, in terms of large scale systems and service sector uh, portions of the economy, among the last to not be technologically disrupted and the most important. So, I mean, again, this is what our, our thought at Murder Accountability is, if you can, if technology can help you find a hotel room more effectively and more cheaply, uh, why can we sort of apply those same principles to catching killers? I mean, just it just makes good sense. And I guess where I'll leave off is the federal government now in the US. So Canada is not changing this anytime soon. It'll be interesting to see what happens if if we do. Uh, and I, I would like to think there'd be um, some consistent onboarding across the country. But um, I mentioned where we get our murders reported by police to the federal government from the Department of Justice. They have said that effective next year, they will not accept submissions in UCR or Uniform Crime Reporting. That they want the new system is what's called, it's the acronym is NIBRS, National Incident Based Reporting. Well, to use that system, number one, you can't be on paper, and number two, you need to be using, you need to be using an operating system that will support it. And how many uh, police departments these days in the United States do you think uh, have that degree of technology? Very few. So what's going to happen is uh, you're going to see my guess is 40% of the murders currently being reported to the federal government will continue to the other 60. And this is on top of the ones not reported due to error. The other 60 just will never be known. So at Murder Accountability, we've contacted a number of these departments and said, um, continue submitting to us in UCR. And you can't support NIBRS and the federal government has given, they may give some grants to allow certain departments to upgrade, but not everyone, um, as the academics will know, uh, that will not be an egalitarian process. Um, so there'll be, again, blind spots all over the place. So we've said to those departments that don't get the, the support they need, we'll still take your records and we can still have coast-to-coast uh, -coast accuracy and run it through our own proprietary algorithm and we will report the matches back to uh, the law the the agencies of record to, to take further action so that's the role we're playing and then a lot of those cases get distilled down here to my group at the university and we work them on a more grassroots level so uh, a little bit of bad news a little bit of hopefully inspiring stuff. And uh, at this point, maybe we can open it if anyone's got uh, questions while I leave this this latest slide up. Assuming everyone, I can't, I've been looking down the barrel here for an hour, so I don't know if anyone's still out there, but hopefully everyone's still with us. Thank you Thank very you. much. That was uh, both uh, a very, inspiring and exciting and terrifying talk, uh, but uh, hopefully it leaves lots for us to, to think about. Uh, and uh, Mike, just to tell you that, you know, there are definitely some people on this, uh, in this talk who uh, teach data analytics. So, you know, I think maybe they'd be happy to, you know, work with your data and see, uh, see what they can find as well. Um, so I do have a lot of exciting questions from people. Uh, and I also just wanted, to, uh, you know, I'm acknowledging that, uh, you know, I, I think we said we'd stop at seven, but with your permission, you know, I'll start asking questions and then we'll see how we're doing uh, and recognize that some people might have to, to leave in progress. But is that, uh, is that okay with you? Yes, that's fine. Perfect. Uh, so the first question I'm going to ask um, has been flagged by uh, a number of people. Uh, and so Jennifer asks, how does media, either news reporting or infotainment documentary series, 
uh, affect the academic and or the law enforcement sides of homicide investigation? Great question. Uh, and I actually have a, a, a course on uh, true crime that I begin offering uh, next term. And uh, really, I mean, I've identified uh, four waves of true crime. It actually goes back to um, to sort of the Victorian era um, and, and uh, Dickens, actually, you might say was the first sort of true crime storyteller. Um, and um, now the difference is that there is this um, public engagement and there is this uh, whole other sort of lane that gets opened outside of, of the story with respect to uh, interactivity. And all I'll say is, but I, I mean, I could go on, it's a, it's a whole course. And then, the, then my forthcoming book actually has a whole chapter on this. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a, it's, there's give and take. There are a lot of people who, um, I'm a firm believer in the role of the media in keeping cold cases especially alive and, and keeping dialogue about them going and momentum and pressure on the, the police and on by extension the offender. Um, and But at the same time, and a lot of people do some really, by extension, uh, good work in providing the media with updates uh, and some, doing some of their own online sleuthing, grassroots sleuthing. At the same time, I do take exception with some of these um, some of these documentaries, I'm not I'm not going to advertise them, uh, but uh, they are disinformation, unfortunately, and bend the narrative a little bit to the point that um, I, it's it's a disservice to the investigation, and I think un, unfairly casts a pall over uh, how some of these cases were handled. I mean, some of these documentaries, whether it be, be, be podcasts or features. Uh, aren't remarkable cases and yet they are made into being remarkable cases with conspiracy theories and uh, you know uh, alternate suspects or it could be this you know it could be that so I think um, it, ha it the media and including a docu-series have an important true crime has an important role to play forensically uh, but I think we need to uh, to always bear in mind that um, the ultimate objective of, of these exercises is um, is commercial in nature and it's not as rigorous, for instance, as what we do at Murder Accountability. Great, thank you very much. Um, the next question also uh, has been flagged by a number of people. Uh, it's from Connor um, and they say, my question may be too big to answer here, but I'll put it forward for contemplation anyway. This seems like a serious problem that indicates a need to change law enforcement practices. Uh, but law enforcement reform is a tricky subject in politics and culture now, and deservedly so. Uh, how do you see this topic fitting into the larger discussions around policing, and or how are those larger discussions affecting your work and that of the Murder Accountability Project? So that's a great question. I will give, it is there's a lot to unpack, but I will give sort of a, a straight up the middle answer in that, um, as this narrative unfolded over the has unfolded over the last few months, um, I, I, there's 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 extremes to it, but toward the the center, there is a a very cogent argument to be made that um, there's a fundamental problem with with how they are how police law enforcement agencies are funded, uh, and that doesn't mean defund; it means a re-examine how the, these these resources are are deployed. So, uh, I mean, how can you in good conscience, I mean, some of these boutique units that you hear uh, police departments operating uh, that are, so for instance, in Ontario, there's a, there's a big issue with having police officers in high school. So I, I understand the community, uh, purported community policing service of that. But when you have in Ontario, again, uh, still an unquantified number of deleted or invisible murders. Uh, I mean, why is a volunteer group of students uh, finding that out first? Uh, and I mean, not to minimize or, or trivialize our own work, but uh, I, I think all these uh, issues are coalescing now at a critical juncture that can allow serious and not hyperbolic or, or divisive conversations to be had 
on how do we fix this. Now's the time. Uh, there was an opportunity to do this, and there is the supports to disrupt and reinvent and redeploy resources and funding uh, with the help of, of groups like Murder Accountability and, and us here at the university, and by extension, other academics. Great. No, it's, uh, you know, as you say, I think that's a question we can uh, discuss uh, for quite some time. Uh, a more straightforward one here. Uh, what are the seven parameters that are important to identifying a particular silly serial killer? So the mineral, so um, this could be, uh, you could really get me going here, but based on what we know about serial offenders in terms of their preferences, um, I mean, it's the basis for, for criminal profiling. There's two a priori's. One is the consistency a priori, one is the homology a priori. The consistent, consistency a priori is that serial offenders who have been successful, quote unquote, will remain consistent in their methods because it's worked for them. The other thought, the homology a priori, is that uh, offenders who are consistent in the same fashion in different areas will have common characteristics, will have backgrounds that are similar for them to have, for instance, made the same decision to drive their victim uh, to a secondary crime scene and bury them in a shallow grave rather than just leave them at the primary crime scene. There will be common characteristics biographically that have led them both to think that's a good idea and to stick with it. So that's basically what we look at. We look at age of victim, gender. It's all It's all because, again, we don't know who the offenders are, so we look at the, the characteristics of the victims, which and what we call victimology. So what I just talked about is suspectology, what offenders have in common. Victimology is what victims have in common. So we look at age, uh, gender, ethnicity, um, motive, weapon, uh, and uh, location and time. And what we can't get as of yet, and I did get successfully from the one department in Ontario, is um, disposal or or what we call deposition location. So, um, and it doesn't need to be overly specific, but body found in a car versus body found in a stream versus body found in their own home. I mean, that would be having that additional, what we call psychogeographic data would be huge in terms of fine tuning these, these links even more. Very interesting. Um, a question here, how much do you attribute poor statistics, uh, stats keeping and investigatory practices to a lack of education training in law enforcement? And, uh, you know, I think you spoke to, to the need, you know, for more training as well. Yeah, training and, and funding and, and the fact that, um, and then just larger scale issues um, that affect all record keeping. I mean, the, the all record keeping in terms of uh, just different jurisdictions doing things differently. And as people, and this may change again with COVID, I think people are going to get more community sort of or, or more geographically static uh, and probably territorial. Uh, uh, the Atlantic bubble, there you go. Um, the uh, what I think historically as people sort of move about, there is just isn't that symmetry between systems to so the fact that uh, and we see this in the U.S. in particular, where uh, you know, drive ten miles outside the city limits, and there's a different jurisdiction that's on paper uh, or using UCR, and over the county line, they're digital and using NIBRS. Uh, and we see it even here in Canada in terms of the records management systems being used. Uh, in Ontario, there's one records management system that allows. Uh, multiple police departments spread across the province to sort of speak to each other and, and see each other's records. And then there are other ones that are completely siloed and standalone, such that accessing records of someone who's just maybe an hour away is you have to go through this very convoluted process of re requesting it. So um, it's an infrastructural issue that I think comes down to funding uh, and that is aggravated and exacerbated through training. There's, there's, there's just no question. To go back to my my by class scenario earlier, where people are completing the questionnaires that they 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 half understand the questions. Well, this is among the most important steps in the investigation. So, I mean, that's why we. I mean, it's compulsory in Canada. I don't know of. I know of one successful match that's been made um, while the investigation was still active, uh, and I don't know a single investigator 
past or present who can tell me about any others. So you have a multi-billion dollar system that has worked once as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I, it's interesting because you can obviously draw so many parallels between this and so many other types of systems right. and organizations, but uh, it does seem like we could do a better job. Uh, question from Piper. Now that uh, in some cases law enforcement are able to access ancestry DNA, what role could this play combined with some of the data that uh, you showed us tonight? Uh, good question. Uh, a different talk that I do, uh, but um, every, I mean, it's, it's quite exciting uh, and daunting at the same time. In theory, every case with DNA on file uh, is now solvable and not even necessarily on file, uh, but recoverable from exhibits that if the police still have them can be retested according to current adequacy standards. A sample, an offender sample may be obtained and then uh, put through um, this forensic genealogy system uh, that, quite frankly, if they shut down these, these databases, one in particular tomorrow, so much has already been captured uh, and preserved that, I mean, there's already enough to uh, it'd be laborious, but to track people down through their, their, their heritage. Still there? Wait, no, no, thank you. Sorry, I was just trying to sort through some questions and I had a couple that came in through email as well. Um, so another one that I, we just wanted to throw out there is, uh, do you find that police detectives are open to data analytics in order to solve crime? Uh, and the person was thinking, you know, about the Picton case in BC uh, in which separate sort of police bodies re rejected some data analytics as a, a crime solving tool. So, you know, what about the culture? Here is this, uh, you know, really is 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 there a cultural issue of accepting this as a tool, or uh, what are your thoughts on that? It's hit and miss. As I mentioned, uh, we got a lot of inquiries at Murder Accountability from uh, detectives in the U.S. Uh, I speak on this by invitation uh, at police academies in Canada, and I was in Australia teaching at the police academy in the West there, uh, and it's exciting. Uh, and they're interested. I mean, uh, effectively, there's a tool, an intuitive user friendly tool that we've developed and resources that we can provide um, to make their job easier. So why wouldn't you and to make them more successful? So I'm not sure why you would be resistant to that. Uh, and many or most aren't are not. Uh, some are in, in the um, and really it comes down to these are the same uh, organizations that are notoriously and irrationally paranoid and I mean in terms of uh, secrecy and I'm not going to necessarily again advertise who they are and naturally investigations and police operations need to be confidential but uh, I mean there's not to the detriment of uh, the investigation I mean there's a case here in Ontario uh, I'll give you just a, a very quick example a nine-year-old girl found dead 40 years ago at the side of the road. Um, uh, you know, public appeal, anyone who knows anything about this crime, uh, you know, please come forward. We're tirelessly investigating this and then it goes cold and 10 years later, anniversary piece, you know, help solve this cold case. The girl's photo, uh, you know, no other information released. Uh, all FOI requests denied. Uh, the family kept in the dark and people are putting two and two together, calling in tips in good faith. I mean, the th it's a nine year old girl found uh, walking home at the side of the road. The presumption was uh, she was attacked. This is a sexually motivated crime and, and, and murdered. Forty five years later, they say, oh, we forgot to mention uh, she was the victim of a hit and run. Well, uh, but if you have any information now, call us. Uh, that might have been nice to know the week or so after when maybe someone saw someone disposing of their car, maybe someone in a, in a mechanical shop remembers damage to a vehicle and he was paid cash and told to keep quiet about it. 45 years later, that, that's helpful. Why was that held back? There was no advantage to the investigation uh, to, to not releasing some information. Um, that, I mean, that's not information that, that spoils the investigation if they have a suspect in custody because they've made it public. You're not going to get any information unless you provide some clarity. So not surprisingly, organizations like this one, uh, when we try to build this in Canada, 
uh, outright illegal, quite frankly, refusals uh, to acknowledge our request. Interesting. Uh, we have a more straightforward question here. And, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, the person you mentioned, you might have uh, just wanted to confirm it really. What specifically is the homicide clearance rate? Is it the number of homicide investigations that are sent to trial? Okay, good question. Um, clearance is so it's sort of law enforcement jargon, but it just means the case was brought to resolution. Doesn't mean uh, a charge, doesn't mean a conviction. Uh, so, I mean, that's an even higher bar. So when we see the clearance rate declining, those are just cases brought to resolution, not people arrested, charged and acquitted and then back out on the street. These are just offenders whose identities are, are known to, to law enforcement. So you can, the two ways to, to close a case by clearance are cleared by charge, so the person is arrested and charged, or to be cleared by other or exceptional means. So uh, for instance, you see this in cold cases where there's a DNA match, but the, the killer is since uh, dead. So you can clear that to him, but it's cleared by exceptional means because they're already dead and we don't indict dead people in this country. Um, so that would be one example. Another one could be, uh, and you would rarely see it in, in homicide cases, but you could clear other cases by exceptional means because um, the Crown prosecutor has decided that, you know, yes, the offense occurred, but it's not in the public interest to prosecute it. So that, that would be another way. So it's sort of as a notwithstanding category. So uh, that's what that's what clearance means, which is distinct from from charged or charges included in clearance, but it doesn't need to include it. And certainly it has nothing to do with eventual dispositions in court. Excellent, thanks so much. Uh, Colin Conrad, who is a professor with us here, is asking uh, if one of the big problems with gathering data is related to lack of resources for data input, I wonder if there's a movement to collect unstructured data from local authorities, for example, collecting generic reports or notes that use natural language. Uh, and he asked this question earlier, so I think you did touch on this a tiny bit, uh, but just, you know, I'm interested in your thoughts. So that's what we do at Murder Accountability, and that's what I asked for in uh, in our own request to build Murder Accountability Canada is generic, uh, again, information that um, with no identifying um, information, we're not asking for reports. And the, the one department that complied just provided an Excel sheet with dates and each of the our seven categories uh, indicated. And, um, the argument from those who didn't try to price us out uh, that this was uh, this violated the Statistics Act, and that's that was a consistent argument among among many of them who, who just wanted nothing to do with it, saying that uh, information collected by a government body uh, that could inadvertently lead to uh, that person being identified through secondary means cannot be ever made public. And I've talked to a number of investigative journalists and work on this was stalled due to COVID, uh, but who were looking for workarounds because that didn't ring true to them either. And these are people who deal exclusively in in, in getting redacted or, or sort of neutralized documents that are in the public interest. So um, a movement is growing to sort of close ranks on this and finally get get that done. Great, thank you. Uh, and we're working towards the end of the questions. And thanks again to everyone who gave us uh, questions. Um, Susan was wondering, I've often wondered why offenders are not deterred by all of the technology of DNA. It seems in their world, they know that 60% of crimes are not under uh, you know, um, a microscope, a law enforcement microscope. Yeah, I mean, do they know about uh, that or do they just um, like again the the case from Mississauga are they just are they getting lucky um, I mean one of our concerns at murder accountability and there's been no evidence of this uh, fortunately but we wondered to speak to this question and and how much research uh, do killers specifically, uh, you would think a personal cause killer who had a specific target, put a lot of thought into it, knew they'd be a suspect maybe, and wanted to introduce misdirection or something, would do a lot of research. Um, uh, but it doesn't seem, at least when we look at our, you, our visitor analytics, that that's the case. Our concern was if you were a motivated serial killer for in particular, 
uh, you can you could use our tool, our public tool to to search the cities that have, according to your preferred murder method, the lowest clearance rate. Um, and in theory, I guess they could do that. They're not that motivated or they're not using. That's not what's driving their, their crimes. Um, but uh, I mean, I think yeah, you're, you're right. There is a, a, an increasingly lack of, of a deterrent despite advances made forensically. So I don't think there's a single answer, um, but just one thing that did occur to me, just an interesting side note. What our uh, visitor analytics do show is um, top visitors to our website uh, are American naturally, followed by Canada, uh, followed by uh, Russia at times that correspond with the working hours of their uh, intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. And the thought if you're initially worried about um, would be serial killers using it to shop for cities uh, when in reality it seems it's being mined for um, pro social problems that can then perhaps be weaponized as as propaganda items. Wow, <laughs> very interesting. Um, and we'll take that. I'll, I'll, this will be sort of our our last question. Um, Lauren asked the Murder Accountabilities Project matching system sounds like a great tool, uh, but one question, do you know roughly how many false positives that the system would cause and are there implications for a crime being falsely attributed to someone? Uh, we know of no, so essentially um, there could be a lot of false positives. We, we, have, we have not vigor, and this is what a lot of this work gets handed down to my students here. So we've got a we've had a couple patterns that we have looked into and they, they can neither be confirmed or denied based on the public information that's available and we can't get the original. Obviously, their ongoing investigation, so they're not going to disclose that to civilians and that's fine. Um, but all we do is report back to law enforcement suspected matches uh, and they investigate. We take no investigative action. We don't name suspects. It would be up to them to look into it. And again, because they're overwhelmed, these, these murders are, are such a, a are spaced in, in terms of location and time far enough apart that they've just eluded uh, sort of uh, granular analog linkage through uh, the, orga the organization or sort of the institutional memory of a police department. Uh, and then due to issues with VICAP have never been linked uh, digitally. So we just say, hey, take a look at these. And like they did in Cleveland, it didn't take too long. They said, OK, uh, we've got five victims here. They all have this in common. And uh, then it didn't take too long before, you know, working through a short list of persons of interest, they had a suspect and they, they, the investigation followed its usual course. We are merely providing evidence of of a potential link and what they do with that, they, they do at their discretion. So. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we can only we, we try to vet the matches to ensure that if we're giving a lead for further action, that it's based on our expertise. So our, our team is uh, homicide scholars and former police investigators and um, and then it's vetted again by my team here. So I mean, what comes out uh, if we do uh, send an FYI to law enforcement, it's gone through a pretty rigorous peer review process. Great, thank you very, very much. Uh, this has just been a, you know, I think all of us are kind of a combination of awe and shock about uh, this topic and thinking about it. Uh, and I guess just, uh, you know, one final question before we uh, let you go. Uh, so do you have a list of uh, the, the top documentaries you would recommend and the ones you would warn us away from? Or are you not, uh, not comfortable uh, doing that? Uh, yeah, you know what? I, uh, <laughs> I'm biased because uh, I'm featured in it, but it in terms of and it's an, it's another case we investigated uh, here at the university and that's why I'm in it. Uh, Children of the Snow, which was originally produced uh, for investigation discovery uh, and which is now available on a number of platforms, I think um, is among I think the most tasteful and uh, scientifically and yet and yet engrossing uh, of true crime documentaries I've seen in, in some time, at least as a feature. So it's a three part uh, mini series or what we call a limited series. Um, and, and yeah, for my money, that's um, that would be among the best, uh, at least off the top of my head. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. This is, as I said, has given us uh, so much to think about. Uh, and, and once again, it really does just, you know, our, our view at the School of Information um, Management is, of course, that uh, information and data uh, underlie everything and are the most important topic in the world. So I think that uh, you've given us a lot to think about in terms of, you know, once again, not only thinking about the data, how you know much of it gets missed, how it can be misused, you know, how we can use it more powerfully, but also just the, the need for more rigorous sort of training around uh, data and analytics. Um, so uh, this is great news because it, it gives us lots to work on and to do. Uh, and we're certainly happy. So if you'd like our students to kind of dive in and, and play with data, the data and you know anything we can do, we're certainly happy to do that. Uh, and once again, thank you very, very much uh, on behalf of the school. Uh, if this was our regular lecture, I would now, you know, hand you a wonderful gift, but we will uh, instead send you something uh, since we are not able to do that virtually. Uh, but thank you on behalf of, uh, you know, ourselves, the Faculty of Management and the Faculty of Law. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. And uh, yeah, hopefully this is the start of of an ongoing relationship of some kind. So thanks for having me and uh, maybe we'll see you again soon. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. OK, Bye -bye. good night, everybody. And thank you for tuning in. Please do stay tuned to our uh, website uh, to hear about upcoming lectures.